All right, good afternoon, biochemistry students. I am going to finish up what we are talking on today as we're getting to the end of the class. We are going to finish up chapter 11 today. And so there's about 10, 15 more minutes of things to mention. And most of these are picking up on threads of what we talked about before. We mentioned earlier that some proteins can be covalently linked to a lipid. And then that lipid can just hang out in the lipid bilayer like any other lipid, and the head group will hold the protein in place. And that's what, um, there's a number of different possibilities there. There's a lot of these that are shown right here. You can see that there's different kind of linkages you can do to different kinds of residues. But uh, I'm not, you don't need to know the specifics of these. The one thing you do need to know the specifics of is that you have an outside anchor. There's ones that work on the inside. And there's one important one that works on the outside, and it's complex structure. Obviously, you don't need to know the structure itself, but it's called the GPI anchor because it involves this complex double-headed lipid that actually uh, goes to an inositol group and mannose groups. It's a glycolipid, and then it ends up being connected through a phosphate to the protein itself. This is very common, and this actually has a particular function, and it's a function in outside signaling, so it's important in immunology. I've run across it before, and so I think because I needed to know it at some point, I want you to know it as well. GPI linkers are lipid-based anchors that are outside the cell, and there's particular proteins, and you can break them with a particular kind of enzyme, something that will actually cut any of those bonds in the middle there. So when you look at the different types, there's actually six types listed of different types of integral membrane proteins. Uh, types four and types six are kind of weird, and so I'm not going, I don't actually think of those as being um, the main types. The main types are the four types that you see here. And these are the types that are, again, I've run across these, and so I think it's useful to know these. You have type one and type two proteins, and the main th thing is type one had the N-terminus outside, type two had the C-terminus outside. You can think of the uh, outside being like the main thing. So if you start on the outside, that's the type one, that's the uh, first thing on the list. Flipping that around is type two. If you have multiple crossing of, of the protein of the um, lipid bilayer, it's type three. And then type five is where you have multiple chains that cross multiple times. Um, really, the distinction between type 1 and type 2 is the most important thing here. But while you're at it, you should probably remember that there's type 3 and type 5 as well. And because, it's, uh, uh, because it works this way, there are very important proteins like bacteria rhodopsin. This is the bacterial version of the protein in your eyes that lets you see. And it is a membrane protein. That's kind of weird if you think about it. Why would the protein that lets you see be a membrane protein? Well, probably because it evolved from this membrane protein of bacteria uh, in bacteria where it worked in the membrane and does not help them see, but it does help them sense light. It's one of those deep evolutionary connections that's really interesting. So when you talk about type 3 integral membrane proteins, um, type 3, if you'll remember, is all one chain that has multiple helices spanning the membrane. In fact, bacterial rhodopsin has seven, so you can make this nice little rainbow-colored thing where you have the amino terminus in the blue shade, it's really a purple where they start, and the carboxy terminus in an N shade, like the chain bows way of showing things on pi mole. Um, so the colors are very nice, and uh, this actually opens a door for protons to cross the membrane. We don't use it the exact same way, but we still have the same protein architecture. So if you're talking about how do we see, which is actually one of the topics in chapter 12, you're going to be working with a type 3 integral membrane protein. And so uh, if you have this, uh, if you chart the residues by their hydro, hydropathy, uh, I'm not even sure how to say it, hydrophobicity, maybe, uh, basically, you can, what you can do is you can take each residue and the residues around it, and you can say how hydrophobic is this stretch of residues. And so you can detect that something would, could be a type 3 membrane protein just from running it on a plot like this, where you go residue number by residue number, and then you measure how hydrophobic it is. You can see you have seven regions that are about the same length, and they're all about, uh, they're very hydrophobic, and they're all about the same length. 
And so this says to yourself that each of these is probably a membrane-spanning hydrophobic helix. And this is one of the ways you can actually detect whether something is a membrane protein or not, an integral membrane protein at least, just from the primary sequence alone. We didn't do this for our proteins, by the way, because they are not um, crossing the membrane. Uh, but if they were, we could do something like this with our um, PyMole bioinformatics lab, those of you who are in that. So for instance, let me take this protein. If you had a protein and you ran it this way, you would be saying, which type of membrane protein could this be? And if you look at it, you have one span that's about 20-25 residues long that's hydrophobic. That sure looks like one membrane-spanning helix. And the only question is, is it type 1 with the N-terminus on the outside, or is it type 2 with the N-terminus on the inside? Hopefully I got this right. I'm going to flip back. Type 1 with N-terminus on the outside. Yes, that is right. So that's good. So all these integral membrane proteins, they have hydrophobic residues crossing the, the membrane, and they also have patterns that will show uh, sort of in-between residues at the head group level of the membrane. So you can see sort of a stripe where the membrane goes. If you color charged residues blue, tryptophan residues red, and tyrosine residues orange, you can see that for the most part, you actually have tryptophans and tyrosines that are around the head groups, or maybe just below. You end up with charged residues outside the membrane, and inside the membrane you have none of the above, which is mostly gray. So by doing a colored plot like this, you can say that you see charged residues are outside the membrane, tyrosine or tryptophans are close to the water lipid interface and maybe on the lipid side of that interface because they appear to be just inside. And then inside the membrane itself you have uncharged residues because those are the ones that are gray. There's even a way in which the shape of the protein might be able to affect how fast it moves around the membrane in this sort of fluid mosaic model way that we have. Conventional proteins will be like the ones on the left. They'll just move around. If they aren't anchored, they'll be able to move, but kind of slowly, like a big cruise ship floating through the membrane. But then there are some proteins that are kind of speed boats, and they, it actually looks like what they do is they don't have a normal stripe of hydrophobic residues. They actually have a, um, a mismatch where they're less hydrophobic and this causes the lipids to be sort of uncomfortable around them. And it makes it easier for them to disrupt the lipids and to move through the membrane. They're kind of like an icebreaker is what it says. And so these kind of uh, proteins actually show accelerated diffusion. They're icebreakers on the one hand, but they're sort of speed boats on the other hand because they will accelerate their movement through the membrane. And this appears to be used by the cell. Sometimes you want a protein to move faster rather than slower. So they have this weird protrusive shape, and basically what they do is they distort the lipid bilayer. And if you have a distorted, disordered bilayer, the lipids are more liquid, and you'll be able to move through them faster. It's kind of a cool biophysical kind of um, source of this. And the, other, uh, the only final thing to point out is that you have these areas uh, in, that are due to the lipids themselves self-associating where the lipids themselves are sort of taller. Remember I talked about in class about how you can have, like if you have the whole volleyball team that's together, they're sort of taller than everyone else and you can sort of see them from a distance across the crowd. That's what these are. These are kind of thicker lipids and you see they have these thicker islands of domains that sort of can move around by themselves, just kind of like, it's another part of the fluid mosaic. These can be thought of as pieces of the mosaic as well, and these can move around. Um, these actually are very biologically interesting because they are enriched in cholesterol, and they are the types of lipids that interact well with GPI anchors. So that means you will have GPI anchored proteins associated with these microdomains, and these lipid rafts are what they're called. And so um, sphingolipids, GPI anchors, and cholesterol are all enriched in these things. And uh, you have some of the stuff on the bottom that's other things that are enriched, but I'm not going to, we don't talk about those. Let's talk about the stuff on the top. The three things on the top are the things to associate with these. And these are involved in outside the cell signaling, which is an important thing. 
one of the ways in which these these even move differently which is kind of cool because they're not just islands they sort of swirl they they turn in place like the top of the space needle the restaurant up there or like a, a whirlpool that um, will be swirling around and the way that they showed this they actually saw them um, well uh, I think this is actually experimental and not just a um, simulation uh, but if it's a simulation it's a cool simulation because you have these taller lipids and they don't really fit perfectly with the shorter lipids around them they sort of tilt and when you have tilting in this fluid mosaic context the tilting causes a sort of vortex reaction where they sort of spin in place. And this vortex reaction will happen more at particular temperatures. You see that this one happens the most at 28 degrees. And so this is temperature dependent movement. I just think it's really cool and it shows you how incredibly complex these membranes are. And of course, as you heat it up, you'll see, you do see more of it in general. So lipid membranes are just these incredible dynamic things where they're not just they're not just walls or envelopes they're dynamic processes they're dynamic uh, there's a lot of action that happens with them and you can think through biophysically what's going on with it for those of you who've ever done electroporation you can sometimes use this to open up holes in e coli membranes so that you can get plasmids into it it's you're literally shocking them with the electricity and then the plasmids are able to cross the membrane the reason for that is they actually open up holes, and then when you take away the shock, the holes seal up. And so if you shock them just a little to open up the holes, like you see right here, you can uh, see that that's sort of uh, enough to get a plasmid across, but then the bacterium seals up. And this is the fluid nature of the lipid bilayer that allows it to sort of flow back together and heal up after you even punch a hole in it with electricity. So I think that's really cool. You can see these things if you shock it. And also you know that you can shock it too much sometimes and you actually literally get an arc of electricity pulsing through your sample. In that case, you've basically killed your bacteria because you punched the holes too big in them. So the holes in the membrane, if they're just holes in the regular membrane, they can seal up when the membrane is fluid again. Uh, and you can make permanent holes by having a protein that goes through the membrane with a big hole in the middle. And in fact, there's some things that make really big holes in the membrane. Here's a beta barrel that will actually fit through the membrane. And you can see there's a whole other protein that can fit through this. And we have some pretty big pore complexes, P-O-R-E, pore complexes, that allow things to cross the membrane. These are proteins that are integral, and they can have big holes in the middle, just like that. So here are some examples of beta barrel type integral membrane proteins that have pores in them and they're just really cool I, di I just think these look really cool they're gated by different things and the one all the way on the right is hemolysin and that if you take that name apart blood breaking this is breaking blood cells open it's a toxin that will actually punch holes in cells using a beta barrel that will open up that hole and just let stuff leak out. So all of these, some of these can be for good purposes, but some of these can be for purposes that the toxin wants to happen, but we don't necessarily want to happen. It's interesting, how does hemolysin punch a hole in the membrane? Well, actually, uh, so what it does is it, it's, it's a toxin that floats through your blood and then goes to the red blood cell and like punches a hole in the membrane. And the way that it does that is it actually has this beta sheet. See the orange beta sheet in part A that's folded up. It's a soluble monomer in that configuration. But then when six of them get together, or seven of them, it's heptameric, seven of them get together at a membrane, then that orange part flips down and it forms a beta sheet with seven other orange parts or six other orange parts that forms the beta barrel that punches all the way through the membrane. This is a pretty amazing physical mechanism. So I just wanted to show you this, and it's how you, the toxin solves the problem. How do I make a soluble protein that can punch a hole in the membrane by having this folding orange beta sheet part? And so one of the other proteins on there was a big hole, and that, that's actually one of the bigger beta barrels. It's big enough to transport a small protein, but you've also got to remember it's transporting the water as well. 
And so here's a picture of the water molecules modeled as the blue sort of rock-like structures that are coming through with the protein, keeping the protein soluble as it passes through the pore in the membrane. So the other side of this is that when the protein's embedded in the membrane, the membrane binds the protein as much as the protein binds the membrane. So if you get a crystal structure of one of these membrane proteins, you can actually still see little remnants of the lipid bilayer stuck to the pore. So here's um, the ATPase, which has a big pore in it. And if you look at it, you actually will see these phospholipids still attached in the crystal structure. What's cool about that is you can see where the phosphate is, you can see where the lipids are, and you can reconstruct where the lipid bilayer would be. And so you can get this information. These are called annular lipids. That's the one word to learn about this phenomenon. And they're lipids that are just stuck so close to the protein, it's a little bit of the bilayer, like it can't scrub off that last little bit of the bilayer. And you can see it in the crystal structure. And so the last thing that, and this is the last slide that we have, uh, remember cardiolipin. We said that that was a weird head group where you have like a two-headed lipid, basically. What is the point of that? Well, it's found in the mitochondrial membrane, in the inner mitochondrial membrane, where oxidative phosphorylation takes place. This is a Biochem 2 topic, but it's where your oxygen is turned into ATP. It's an amazing process with lots of membrane proteins. That, that um, And the main thing about it, these are membrane proteins, big complexes, very important to the cell. Cardiolipin is actually an annular lipid that will actually bind two different parts of the same complex, and it will hold those chains together, and it will keep the complex together in place. And so um, there's, we can't say much more about that right now, but eventually you're going to learn the different parts of these complexes. And I just want you to know, lipids are actually an important part of that complex. If you don't have cardiolipin, the mitochondria don't work as well. It staples the complex together. So it's very cool and very important. So all that is to say, this is the homework problems for chapter 11. These are already active on Achieve. So please go ahead and get a head start on them. Uh, if you're able to get a head start on them, then you can encounter problems and you can bring those up to me and I can discuss those on next Wednesday when we have our test review session. So even though the test is still two, uh, a week and a half away, I still want you, um, the best way to do it, if you want to improve, start now. So work on this this weekend, um, bring the problems to me. Remember, data entry sheets are due on Monday, and on Monday we will have our final lecture in 4361. We'll go through biochemistry of sight, seeing, uh, of seeing, tasting, and smelling. Hearing and touch are other things, but those three senses we'll talk about, and I'll see you on Monday, hopefully, to go over that with our final lecture before our test review. All right. Have a good weekend, everyone. I will see you soon.